All right, so we are here today at Sheffield's Beer Garden with Sunshit Arvin, and we are going to talk about the book Sapiens right here by Yuval Harari, and this this is a great book, fantastic book, and so I thought, why not? Why not get Sunshit here, and we can talk about it. Um, why don't you give your uh, give an intro for listeners uh, about the book or about by yourself? yourself okay, right. sure. Um, so, okay, my name is Sancho. We're I, drinking uh, some some mezcal right which here. I have too. to say, by the way, this smells like very intoxicating. I don't know if it's just me, but the smell of alcohol is just like it's it's really strong. Very, it's very so intoxicating. Um, mm. But yeah, so I I am an immigrant. I came here in 2014 for undergrad. Uh, I went to Miami University of Ohio, did math and econ there. Once I graduated in 2018, I got a job as a tech consultant. But more importantly for me was I joined a funk band, uh, and that became like <laughs> a, funk band, yeah. it became a really core part of uh, <laughs> living in Cincinnati and going to college there. Um, I lived there for a year, then I moved here in the um, I think the second week of March 2020 before they locked everything down. So it was yeah. a tumultuous <laughs> first yeah. year, I think, when I was living out. Um, but yeah, so now I've been working at the same job for about three years now. I, um, I play keyboard in my funk band. I found some music over here. Yeah. I, um, I like to read a lot. I'm, I'm kind of a nerd for TV shows. Well, that's, that's, that's why he's uh, on. Yeah. He's a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> you, nerds coming together to talk about books. Who would have thought, right? To be to be honest, I the way I, I, when you when you um, when you messaged me about okay potentially doing an episode together, I was like, it's got to be like a book club team because I I, I I haven't heard a podcast that is basically a uh, like a book club, right? But if you recorded the meeting and then released it, and I thought that oh, this yeah, would yeah. be like a cool opportunity to try something like that where we like pick a topic because I think like. Um, I still remember like meeting you for the first time, uh, like just ha- with a book at a bar, which for is the first time. So I'm bartending. Yeah. Bartending. <laughs> yeah. I'm playing bartender, right? <laughs> yeah, and and it's reading a book. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? You just and and it was it was also like a particularly curious book because I think it was like a history of science written um, by a German post World War One. Right. It was. Oh it was, yeah, yeah. It was uh, a little history of the world. Right. Yeah. By, written uh, as, as for his kids. Gombrich. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the story with that book, real quick, yeah. it's like, so, so he went to like, he got his master's in art history. This guy, this German guy, E.H. Uh, e. Gombrich, I believe is his name. And so this is like 1933, and he started working for this publisher. And, and they got this proposal for like a history of the world for, for children, like a children's book. And it was like, they got this two page proposal And he says to his boss, like, this is garbage. I could write something better than this. So then he goes, then why don't you do it? So then he's like, fine. So then he, uh, in six weeks, he just buried himself in all the materials he had at his house, all these encyclopedias, and then he would go to the library and then just look up whatever else. So it's just like (laughs) this really quick read, uh, but it it covers so much. Like, if you just want, like, a, a, a brief history of... The humans for children, that's like a cool version, and this is like the adult version. Yeah, in a way. Well, I, I think in terms of a mission, both of those, the Sapiens and um, the book that you mentioned, try to do the same thing, right? Yeah. Like, um, you know, most books tend to be like specific. Uh, you know, I'm going to write about financial crashes or Bitcoin or something, right? Something very specific, yeah. This is like the history of hum- humanity, right? Yeah. Like, it is yeah, yeah. ridiculously broad in scope. Um, and I think that's what makes it so interesting as well. Uh, but yeah, this I encountered this actually. I think I saw him give a TED talk first, and it was uh, back in the phase when everyone was watching TED talks. This was the I think number two or number three trending because it was like okay, why uh, why are humans so successful? I think the second one, by the way, like when this was part of the same TED talk playlist, it was I don't know if you would remember this is like why Steve Jobs' speeches are so successful, the whole idea thing. You explain why, then you explain what, then you explain how, as opposed okay. to traditional way of thinking. But anyway, um, <laughs> that's a side note. So Sapiens uh, encountered his TED talk as first, which was the explanation for why humanity is um, the way it is, right? Like none of this around you is natural. How did we build this? From how did this all come? How did this all come about? Why? 
why is it normal for you to pay someone to clean your house or you know back in the like where caves are just like dust right like yeah. it, it makes no sense so um, so yeah I mean it was an incredible TED talk 20 minutes um, and then I encountered this book through my dad uh, where I was like oh it's this guy okay cool um, and reading it changed my life completely I read it in college and then like um, every sensation or thought that I had felt since then, I was like, oh, this is probably because in Sapiens he wrote this chapter. Like, I, I, really? everything, it changed the way I view everything. Wow. Um, so it was definitely like a influential book for me. So. so we're coming into this book. I read this book three years ago, hmm. and it seems a little bit more recent and a little bit more on, on your mind. The way I read books, I, I really don't remember like what, what happens in the book. I just pull out big puzzle pieces. So it's like when I read books, I'm searching, not necessarily searching, but by the end of a book, I I acquire a puzzle piece. Okay. It's like uh, a wait. question. It's like, like um, it's like a almost like a gift that the book gives me. Okay. And then in my life, it's like I'm I'm trying to put together this massive puzzle. And this is like one piece that you're it's just, like, just okay. one piece. Okay. So it's like not trying to remember everything that's in a book. It's just like, what's the big thing I can take away from this book and apply then to my life and, and put in the puzzle? You know, this is this is really that is such a <laughs> weird way to approach. I think like <laughs> like reading. Um, uh, but okay, so there's this like tree of knowledge, right? And every okay. bit that you find is like another branch that you put in this tree. You don't know what the whole tree is, but everything that you read kind of is a branch there. Is, yeah, is like, that is that a fairly accurate? Except, I don't know what the tree looks like. Yeah, I don't sure. know what yeah. the puzzle looks like, but I'm just like putting it together. Okay, this is good. This is uh, this is exciting. To well, me. he has a chapter on this. Actually. Oh, really? Well, the, when he gets to the science chapter. Um, which is, I think, in part four, like the the scientific revolution, okay. right? Uh, one of the core tenets of like science uh, is uh, ignorance. We don't know everything. Uh, prior to that, uh, when we were dominated by like the age of empires and the age of religions and uh, you know age of agriculture, um, everything that uh, needed to be described about the world was described. If you had a question, uh, ask your priest. Ask your Imam, ask your uh, Sadhguru, right? Whatever yeah. culture you're part of, ask your religious leader yeah. to explain something. Um, and if, if, if you had a question that, you know, didn't, wasn't documented in that, then it wasn't worth knowing. Like, that, that was yeah. the approach that humanity yeah. had to, uh, to the first, what, like 10,000 years of history, where yeah. we call history, like, when, you know, we can, we actually have, like, agriculture like not just foraging but culture just in general not agriculture um, but one of the core things that happened I think in 1500 was the year that he'll say is like we decided to change our approach to the world to be more scientific so the he'll explore in like part four like why and what were the circumstances and what was the impact and stuff like that uh, but I found that really interesting it's like science is defined by okay one we don't know everything that is around us mm -hmm. uh, there's stuff that we do not know two uh, I can uh, actively obtain and seek that truth though. I can add yeah. to this body of knowledge. Yeah. However, at any given point in time, like everything that is known can also be disproven. Right? Yeah. It is totally possible for yeah. some new scientific observation to come about that, and like, dispute that. Oh man, that. That, leads us, that can lead us in a whole other direction. <laughs> Why don't we start at the beginning and describe, give a summary of Sapiens, the book. Oh man, okay. Okay, so it's a brief history of humankind. What he tries to do is explain uh, our place in the world and how we came here, how um, a lot of myths that people have about human history, and he tries to bust a lot of them, and he tries to explain kind of like what, what did we do, what were the different things in our overall history that have allowed us to do that. And he talks about, like, he makes a lot of cool distinctions, I think, when he describes this. It's a pretty tough task, right? Let's be, yeah. let's put the cards on the table. It's not easy. <laughs> you know, humanity has been around for a while. Written history, maybe 4,000 years. Unwritten history, maybe even much longer, right? Um, but so he'll start by explaining or putting the context of history in these revolutions, right? So the first being the cognitive, which allowed us to kind of forge cultures and eventually push every other species of homo 
out, right? There was so other, there, there, there were, were five other ones, right? Yeah, Neanderthal, yeah. Erectus. I don't know, all complicated some names. Other science some names. Some other yeah. complicated <laughs> names. But yeah, and you know, a lot of like theories of evolution. I read this other book also, a brief history of nearly everything by Bill Bryson, and he also talks. I about I have this. that book. I haven't oh, read it. Oh, it's fantastic. It's a little old though. It's written in like the early two thousands. So there's a lot more science oh, that has happened, wow. right? Wow. Um, so, but anyway, um, okay, back to this, right? Is uh, there are a lot of different theories of this evolution, right? Like, but a lot of people, like, if you think about the image of evolution, what you think of is like ape to like man in a computer, right? Which is like yeah. in every single textbook, this has been inscribed. And so we always think of evolution as this like linear every, path. like screen tea that you see, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. And then some like joke about it, how we're going back to sitting down and being cavemen with our phones or something yeah. like that. But I feel like that has programmed us to think of evolution as this linear process where we are the end, right? Yeah. This is the perfection, but. In, in yeah. the, that's not at all the case. No, right? that's that, it's not. not. It's, it's, evolution is nothing but a series of mutations, which is just mistakes, right? And yeah. so everything about this is happenstance. Um, so, uh, okay, yeah, when he was talking about evolution, though, right, one cool, important, like, uh, within all of these... Um, Within all of these revolutions, so the, the made, revolutions like, are the cognitive revolution, agricultural revolution, scientific revolution, uh, and then there's the like the unification, yeah, kind of which is three. I right? think I think I think the scientific is the last one. In yeah. between agricultural and um, scientific is like the rise of empires and yeah. religions. I don't remember what it's called, but it's that revolution yeah. that led to like how. Um, you know, yeah, like the Roman Empire, like how the hell did that become a thing? Like, we always viewed us versus them, right? It wasn't always true that the more of us there are together, the better it was. Um, yeah, so we have part one, the cognitive revolution. Yeah. Uh, then part two, the agricultural revolution. Part three, unification of humankind. Unification of humankind, right, <laughs> That's yeah. a big one, right? Yeah, religion, uh, money, I think, is covered there too. And the scientific Science. revolution. So yeah, within like these four chapters, I think like he'll use each of the revolutions to explain um, kind of like why it happened, how it happened, um, and the consequences, which I think is the most important part. Like, okay, yeah. the, how did that shape us now, and how we think about the world, yeah. and how we behave and interact with other people? Um, I think the part, I think the cognitive revolution is like the new idea, right? So a lot of people have like ways of explaining this. I think Chomsky has this like the language gene, okay. right? The cognitive revolution is the first thing that allowed us to band together and like communicate and express ideas, right? So his key idea that I find really, really interesting there is that see, language in and of itself is not that unique, right? All sorts of yeah. animals, apes do it, dolphins do it. But all their language is about things that exist within reality. There's a river over there and a pride of lions yeah. hanging out. Our language is kind of weird because we have the ability to express things about things that don't exist anywhere but our imaginations. Yeah. Um, and he's got this really powerful sentence right there. It's like, um, I, I do not dispute that uh, the UN should impose sanctions on Libya for violation of human rights. My only observation is that the UN Libya and human rights do not exist anywhere but in our heads. There is no thing that you can point to in the world that is like, oh, here's a human right. Like, no, yeah. like it's only, it comes out well, of this. The, the things we agreed upon. Exactly, right? Yeah. The reality. The that imaginary you, things we it's, agreed it's on. A yeah. beautiful, it's, so it's a really powerful concept when you think yeah. about it, right? Because then you ask yourself, like, okay, how many things in my world are constructed versus real? And like, literally everything is constructed. Like, yeah. you realize, like, it's very few. And it's not like a good or bad or scarier it's just that's why we've been able to do a lot of this right that's why we have been uh successful at domesticating animals back way back yeah. when building atom bombs now and yeah. you know everything in between uh, and it's crazy too we're just like in the middle of this beer garden right yeah and uh you're an immigrant from uh dubai right yep and yeah. it's like, and then I'm just a country boy from Wisconsin, and, we, <laughs> and here then we are. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> how it's, does that happen? How does right? that happen? No, and it's because of all these things that took thousands of years. Yeah, and lots of suffering, and which he he, he's, he, he definitely he, he definitely on. points out. Yeah. Definitely <laughs> points out. Oh, and that okay in that cognitive revolution chapter two, I think like on this suffering topic, the um, the biggest secret of our species, right? The yeah. original genocide was the. The, we were not the only species of homo. Yeah. Yeah. Now we are. And yeah. why? And you know, generally, like, okay, the, the, there's multiple theories of this. And then what he'll do is in the book, he's like, he like evaluate each one and like debunk them. It's actually pretty funny, actually, the way he'll approach it. 
because a lot of them like stem from this understanding that humanity is like the pinnacle, right? And like we were designed to be this way because we're perfect this way. That's yeah. not that's not the case, right? Your first thing is to take a step back and like everything being an accident. It was a very um, like the Neanderthals left the homeland first and settled in like I think it's uh, Eastern Europe now, where it was okay. way back way colder back then because it Earth was in the middle of an ice age. About like 10,000, 30,000 years later, another band of a different species of Homo sapiens had left, and with our like um, new languages and cultures and better ways of motivating groups of people to do things, mm -hmm. it was no match for the Neanderthal. Like you would have lost a one-on-one -on -one with this person. This person was really, and they weren't like their brains were bigger, right? Like their, um, they were definitely capable of doing other things. It was just that like. The sapiens cognitive revolution enabled them to like just wipe out every other <laughs> uh, species of homo yeah. I, I think he'll call it like we weren't like so because in bio in biology it's called a family right like it's family genus and then species okay. um so we think of ourselves as the only person in that family we had brothers and sisters we just killed them <laughs> like, like just, so what, what does he say in the book because i don't yeah. remember specifically uh he well, that, right? He says that there are these, uh, there are, like, archaeological evidences that you can find of, like, uh, the presence of, uh, like, certain types of fossils up to 30,000 years, which is when we think sapiens enter that land, and then, like, no other remain can be found. Um, now, like, now DNA tests do prove some cool stuff, though, right? Is that, uh, like, people have Neanderthal in them, and people have Erectus in them, right? I think, like, populations of Europe have, like, well, it's, it's a small percent, so there was... Like, there was definitely some intermingling, you know, I don't think that we killed everyone and anything in sight, you know, maybe there was some kind of corpus. Yeah. The, the, a lot of this you don't know, right, like, because we, the, like, the present evidence is just, it's like one bone, right, that you yeah. see, and you're like, okay, what, like, how right. can you, any, any inference you make out of this has to be extrapolated at some level. Um, but, like, an increasing amount of the evidence suggests that generally when we came, we wiped everything out. This is true of animals too. When we enter the continent of Australia, oh, that's like a phenomenal. Yeah. So then up. we go to Australia, megafauna. Yeah. Done. Done. <laughs> Americas. Done. Done. <laughs> the the chapter on Australia is also like beautiful because uh, marsupials like just had like Americas and Australia has never even had like these bipedal apes like ever, right? So. Uh, at least in the savannas, uh, the other creatures didn't have time to evolve natural defenses against apes because we uh, we were faster than evolution, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, but they knew to avoid humans, right? Even lions yeah. were like, oh, we don't really want to hang out with this yeah. because they know how to like fire and stuff like that. Yeah. The like giant, I think it's called the dipedron or the like even giant kangaroos and koalas. Imagine that, right? You're this like massive 150 ton creature. You see this like random two footed ape scrawny like just walking around you yeah. give it a second thought right you just like, what? like who gives a shit but then we just went there and we like burned everything right yeah I, I can't even imagine uh inch and ape scary yeah, right yeah, yeah yeah oh man so okay yeah. talk about uh so part one we have the cognitive revolution yeah we touched on some things there so what happens until we get to the agricultural revolution so um okay we see we see, uh, okay, so he'll ask a lot of questions about like uh, society, culture, um, what, like, okay, it's one thing to look at this evidence and stuff like that and, uh, you know, make inferences about what we did to the world, but what about ourselves? Like, how did we live? Did we have gods? Did we have um, uh, rituals? Did we have, did we do sacrifices? Like, what kind of stuff did we did, right? Again, we don't know. Evidence that we have is hazy at best. Plus, like, I think making like a causal inference on some of this stuff is pretty hard. Like you can definitely make an assumption or yeah. about, but like deterministically saying this is how we live is is impossible with the current evidence that we have. But that said, like there is evidence that suggests we have like uh, some sort of uh, cultures. There are like these uh, in, uh, Stonehenge-like structures that were found in Turkey that they like, dated uh, to uh, Golapaki. Yeah, I, I, something. Yeah, I, we can open the book if we want. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> sometimes I go down these like YouTube rabbit holes yeah. of like uh, ancient ancient ruins, and it just blows my mind. Bunch in like India, these like temples. I'm temples like, with, like with very intricate carvings, right? Yeah. And it's like. Yeah, so with, okay, so with Cognitive Revolution, like society, how was it structured? Mostly hunter-forager, 
We didn't actually do that much hunting. We were more foragers. Okay. We had a very strong connection with the natural world because we had to, right? You had to be able to look at a berry and tell whether it would kill you or like be, you know, <laughs> sweet, right? Yeah. You had to be able to smell a mushroom and again be able to determine whether it would kill you or uh, so we had like a very good connection with the natural world. We knew about our surroundings. Um, so I bet our, our senses were a lot stronger. Our geographies. Right? Well, I, I I don't think I don't think they've become weaker. I they're think just, that they're just clouded. Probably, well, I think right? that I think that our senses now are actually a result of that. Like right now, you're you're living in an urban jungle, but your brain thinks you're in the savanna. And so like so okay, I moved to Chicago. I understood the like geography pretty well yeah. because I know how to like I, I have this instincts right of like knowing geography, and we all have that sense to figure out where is what and discover and be good and have our internal compass like calibrated right we all have this like impulse a lot of it might come from that right where we had to know the lay of the land so extensively and that that has just been coded into our behaviors now while our geography has changed yeah. like dna and biology doesn't evolve at the pace at which we do yeah which is the second interesting thing about that cognitive revolution bit right um, so he calls this uh, at the cognitive revolution, history became separate from biology. Up until that point, history was biology. Evolution determined what we did as a species. We had no control over anything else, right? If there was a big ass ice age, it was a big ass ice age. And so you mean like, uh, so oh, so like we didn't have any control over our environment, right? Yeah, yeah okay. we we were completely dependent on it. Yeah. And and in so much as like, you know, we could. Like the whole making up our own stories and our own cultures and stuff like that, like that would only be dependent on what the environment did, right? If there was an ice age, there would be an ice god. If there was a oh, global warming age, there would have been like a fire god or something like that, right? It was completely dependent on biology. Yeah. From the cognitive revolution, when we could start making up these myths and start making up these um, figures and deities and stuff like that, history became a separate from biology. It's a it's an interesting concept, right? Is so it's a very interesting yeah. concept. <laughs> You don't think about a lot of the stuff that he suggests in this book, which is why I like it. So, okay. Um, so what? What? Okay. That. So yeah. Any other questions on cognitive? Uh, other than <laughs> we determined that Homo sapiens were just smarter than all the other animals. <laughs> See, not not. <laughs> we applied ourselves more. We applied ourselves. We applied ourselves together. Right. Like, we, like we that. realize that communication about the non-natural world is an asset. As a matter of fact, like, this is also why, like, gossip became a thing. It became important to us who leads. And if you're leading, are you sleeping with someone else? And that might be a problem if it, like, puts the tension of the group. Uh, if it upset, yeah. like, group dynamics evolved because of stuff like that. It's super interesting, right? It's like, why do you think our tabloid sections are still the most important part of the newspaper? It's because gossip is such an important part of us. It, that's that is super interesting because yeah. like I just can't stand all the <laughs> gossipy things and like um, you are uh, you're fighting against the current though right <laughs> story of my life <laughs> <laughs> I is, don't I don't see the point it doesn't seem productive but what you're saying is that it's programmed in us because because it was important it was important to foster cooperation right it became important to share information about uh, everyone within the tribe yeah. um, and having like perfect information to borrow an economic term was very important so that the survival of everyone was guaranteed yeah. right if that person was put in a compromised position to make decisions the tribe had to know otherwise they would die right like and, yeah. and at the end of the day like the currency of evolution and stuff is just numbers right it's, and back then when biology was ruling all of us like that was the only thing that mattered it's no other yeah so speaking of numbers, the agricultural uh, revolution. Right, yeah. That's that's the main thing, the main takeaway from Yeah. Uh, we could now exponentially multiply, right? The So the, okay, there's a lot of cool stuff that he says, right? Like one is so numbers, the part that stuck with me most was like you know, think of the life of a chicken, right? Like evolutionarily it's a success, but like quality of life wise kinda sucks, right? Being yeah, like yeah. cooped up. So so numbers is, is a kind of a fickle mis mistress there, right? That yeah. you were trying to serve. But yeah, what the agricultural revolution did for us, it allowed us to uh, yeah, sustain more. But like 
it wasn't necessarily a better quality of life that we so right. we automatically assume that yes, that it had to be. It was a significant improvement. Not necessarily, right? Because our, our diet became less yep. uh, varied. It, and it became just wheat yeah. and potatoes, right? That's it, yeah. like or whatever you could yeah. grow. Yeah. If the flood destroyed the wheat, you're dead. Like at least yeah. then you could switch to another source. But no, here you're out. Like that's it. Yeah. Um, became riddled with disease because we stayed in one place and generally more people are hotbeds for disease as we've yeah. discovered in this COVID time but um <laughs> well we didn't discover it, it oh we, well we yeah we knew it yeah we knew it um he calls it the biggest lie um which I thought is a pretty strong statement right that's like he calls it like the biggest lie that it, that it was a good thing yes yeah and that it was, was surprising when I first read it yeah that I, time ago I don't know I'm a farmer I grew up on a farm so I'm like <laughs> hey hey now <laughs> I don't know if I like 100% agree with the it was the biggest lie right so what does he say is the advantage of people settling down there? just the fact that we were able to sustain more build newer imagined realities and then eventually like the unification becomes when we all kind of bundle together, right? Yeah. Is that it, I think, uh, so skipping a little bit ahead in the book, uh, uh, the Persian king, it was a Darius or Cyrus or uh, one yeah, of Yeah, there's, uh, I know, like, Darius, was Cy it Darius? It was with I C. Think, yeah, I think it was like, Cyrus was like the first badass. Okay. And like Darius, and then Darius's son carried out, was Xerxes, and he tried to get revenge on the Greeks. On the Greeks, okay, that was I think the he whole. his father, yeah. So, I think it was Cyrus, the first badass, right? Yeah. Why he was the first badass was he was one of the first emperors to shift away in how we approach uh, humanity. Before it was always us and them, but now the king was like, hey, you're not part of my country, but you need to go on this pilgrimage. I will, I will build a road so that you do this. Because I am the king for all people, not just my people. Even the subjects that I conquer, I am the king for them as well. Yeah. That was like a... It, this is all, again like mind blowing that that was actually like a dramatic shift in the way like rulers were approached. Before you only look after your own tribe, yeah, you, and you actually warred with other tribes over competition for the same resources. Yeah, that's a great point, right? But yeah. like suddenly there was this like switch. It's like expansion is better, uh, yeah. and togetherness is more important. Again, it was so like all of these points. I think like in his his thesis is that all of these things are myths that we all just bought into. And so today, yeah. our present is a sum of every single myth that you can qualify. And this is a big one, right? That mm -hmm. for, what, for what reason is like our, all of us being together? It's not like self-evident, right? That just all of us being together, separating us and them is in inevitably a good thing. Not really. There are like strengths in like small tribes and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I think back to agricultural revolution and numbers. I forget the topic that we were... Um, I was like, uh, it's perceived as good, but... Oh, it's... okay. Yeah, it not necessarily... It's kind of hard to ex accept the thesis okay. that it was... Um, it is, like, the biggest fraud. But I think his key point is the idea of the future, right? That the agricultural revolution, what it actually meant was us breaking our backs for a select few plants that actually gave us worse off nutrition in the hope that next year things would be better. And this actually became another wow. like dramatic shift yeah. in the way we approach the world. So, oh, so he, he mentions in there that like when when you're hunter gatherers, you don't think about the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You literally are just surviving yeah, every now. single day. There's no thought about the future whatsoever. But when you're planting, you can now when yeah. you're planting, the season. People love and, thinking about the future. Well, how do I? improve my yield next year yeah how can i if the night oh i found out this year that if the nile floods by a centimeter more um that's extremely problematic so you know what i'm gonna dig these irrigation canals and yeah. break my back doing it and uh next year maybe there's a drought and that's useless and i'm gonna die anyway but hey i'm gonna do it because i think that next year the future will be better and this is like a mentality that's so like in the long run you know we're all good right like stocks will rise like yeah. like stuff like that like still dominates our thought we should plan for the future what if an emergency happens how did you plan for that like that came from that fear and anxiety came from the agricultural revolution um, or at least do he you, traces it do you ever think 
randomly yeah, while sure. you're on the train or wherever <laughs> that we all have the DNA of the survivors. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the way that natural selection would have worked, right? So yeah. a lot of the thoughts that we have, if like they're a lot of the approaches and the mentalities that we have are the, of the people that survived, not of the folks that had passed away. Yeah. So it's kind of sad, right? That um, the the dead, uh, the ones that, or it's kind of a scary thought that like how many ideas have we missed yeah. because the people couldn't uh, propagate, right? Yeah. Oh, we, only know, we only know. What we only works, know. We only know. Yeah. We only know what works, right? It's, yeah. Wow, it's an interesting thing. All right, so we're in the agricultural revolution. This goes on for a very long time. Yes, yeah. Lends um, itself to um, new cultures. Lends itself to... Um, actually, this was worse off for the farmers. Because like they were like, oh, next year I'll have more yield so I can survive a bad winter. Well, that more yield, like eventually these agricultural societies had like a ruler that just took that more yeah. yield and then like took it for themselves, right? Yeah. So actually, like it was the worst thing that ever happened for people that decided to. Because it wasn't. It wasn't I didn't just mean like, to, like tug at your. Oh no! Because no. uh, <laughs> it wasn't like oh we're all gonna have our own farms and yeah. grow crops to sustain ourselves. No. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was really. No. I wanted to do this for myself, <laughs> and like sure, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's um. Uh, you know, like, he, he offers a good amount of evidence that suggests that... How about this? I think that his take about the agricultural revolution is, uh, is is very interesting because it points out a lot of things that people don't talk about. It wasn't all that great. Yes, it did allow us to build a lot more, produce more per person, and build a lot of this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, like, history is like a... History is a chaotic process, right? Had things, had you restarted the whole thing again, would we see the agricultural revolution? I don't know. I don't think like it always plays out, so you always need to get um, farms. Yeah, but if it's in our DNA to like, did we, I guess what, did Homo sapiens start agriculture to just have more food or to like be together more no and it was it was just it was just a way of uh, we figured it, it was like we figured out a pattern to grow the sweet and have an extra supply of food yeah. just in case time the hunt didn't go well yeah. and then that became a oh you know what if I like tweak it a little bit more if I tweak it a little bit more if I tweak it a little bit more but by then we had already set an event in motion that we had yeah. no idea how was going to change us. And then once the structure starts, it's never going it's away. No go it's, it's not, not going, going away. Back. Once you believe in the myth, it, it, it's there. Well, because then if you're you're still out foraging and stuff, well now all the people with numbers can yeah, just can take just, you it, over. Well, exactly, right? And right. yeah, if you're a forager, you're actually worse off in this because now like yeah. you have the system with uh, with food reserves and stuff like that. Yeah. And like yeah, you'll be alone really. Like there are not many tribes back then yeah. um, who would end up as foragers in a society of agriculturists. Yeah. Um, yeah, then, I mean, yeah, the other things about the agricultural revolution is, like, it's also, um, it was horrible for some animals, right? Like, the domestication of animals and stuff came as a result of that, but, like, um, you know, of course, there are, farm I'm sure, like, you know, you were nice to your farm animals, but, like, um, like, mass meat production houses are, like, evil places, right? <laughs> is there, yeah, just like... Yeah, just slaughterhouses, right? Just commercial slaughter. Yeah, yeah, it's just... it's And it's awful, right? Um, and, and it wasn't... Like, we weren't nicer to the animals back then. We were pretty bad, like, consistently, right? We, yeah. we were pretty bad. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't really the best thing for a select group of animals. We weren't... We're not, like, a good species for Earth. You know, we've caused the most extinctions. We've... We've killed the most of ourselves. We've killed the most of others. It's really like a pretty evil. Like <laughs> he also says this. Like, I think like a lot of the apex predators of other um, like families, uh -huh. right? They look like predators, right? Yeah. Like look at the lion. Like that actually looks like the king of the jungle, right? With that mane and the yeah. You don't want to mess with that guy. Sorry. You don't want to mess with that. You don't want to mess with that guy, yeah, right? Yeah. But like he, like we are the most like short stature apex predator and that feeds into a lot of our anxiety uh, we don't really belong in that place of like the top of the food chain we kind of cheated our way into it we figured out how it works how to game the system and how to make myths 
um, and then uh, we're there. And so evolution hasn't given us like that stature of like a really advanced uh, this thing. Hey, hey, that was an interesting thought as well from the book that yeah. I liked. Um, okay, so where are we at now? Where? So I think we're entering unification now. Okay, the unification of humankind. This one is like the most interesting, I think, because it. It's a new way of thinking on three big things that are part of our lives, right, inextricably. Oh, well, maybe not and so much, but definitely part of history. Money, um, empires, Money. and... <laughs> sweet, <laughs> sweet dough. Um, that sweet, sweet dough, empires, and religion. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the money chapter is very interesting, right, like how it evolved. What I find interesting about the evolution of money is that... Um, yeah, this kind of feeds into something that we were talking about earlier, is uh, had you reset the whole thing again, would it all have happened the same way? So money, like, and even farming, um, evolved separately in the sense that there were two tribes that had no contact with each other at all, but the principle of money evolved still. Yeah. A way of having like something that represents value that you could store and everyone agrees on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's an interesting concept, right? It's like, so it wasn't that someone discovered it and then everyone started using it. A lot of history is like that, right? With math, for example. Um, yeah. The Indians made the numbers, the Arabs figured out how it was useful, and then Europe just used it. Yeah. Um, but with money and stuff, right, is, uh, again, there was spreading of coins, or I think it was called shekels first, right? The first silver coin. I, yeah, that, I think those were the first ones. Like yeah. in Mesopotamia that they had used. Um, it became um, first like silver, then gold, or any kind of like rare metal. Uh, then bronze and then some shiny or, stuff some shiny stuff right shiny to metals. represent value yeah. um, but a lot of this evolves like individually I think China had its own or ancient Chinese like Han Dynasty societies had their own unit of measure that value Harappa and India also had the same the Incas as well had some sort of like uh, unit of value that they would use and these tribes never really spoke to each other maybe China and India did yeah. and India and Rome definitely did but um, like South Americans were just separate from everything how did they get money where did they get the idea from? It's kind of interesting, right? This, well, so uh, I did a podcast episode on what ancient artifacts tell us about humankind. And you go to the, uh, I go to the Field Museum all the time, and you see, you know, you'll go check out Africa and, and like, um, you know, the Pacific. You go to the Pacific, you go to the Americas, and there's Egypt and Asia. And all the artifacts are pretty similar. Yeah. And it's like, they didn't have any interaction yeah. with each other. Yeah. They they didn't know about each other's existence, yet all the same things show up. It's I think I think that comes from the myth building. Yeah. Um, like from the cognitive revolution, right? Once, once we figured out how to create stories and myths that we all collectively believed in, a lot of those stories tended to be the same thing. Yeah. Right? Like, like every religion, every monotheist religion, largely the same, right? Some dude figured it out and then told everyone how to live, right? That, largely yeah. the same concept. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 it's not that surprising. Maybe, like, the, the details of the story would be different. Maybe we would have used twigs or something that wasn't precious for money instead of something that was precious. I don't think it had to be something that was rare. I, I feel like that was think just so? happenstance. Yeah. I, I, I think that was just happenstance. Yeah. Like the way our society was like, oh, this is rare to find. I like things that are rare to find. Why? Like, <laughs> for what joy? Yeah. If use the thing that's easier to find, right? Like, how does that matter? It's money. Like, is it <laughs> we use paper now, right? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's you're right. The the artifacts being similar is is interesting. Um, so we have all these different empires that are they're kind of gobbling each other up throughout time and well yeah and empires the interesting thing there is um, uh, it was never well a lot of it like and again these are very broad brushstrokes because he's he's all of humanity right, right. Um, not every empire was like Im- impositional like you have to follow our culture a lot of them was like when. Um, you know, when they'd conquer their subjects, uh, the subjects would take on parts of like that same empire. And I think he'd do this very elegantly with um, uh, so Roman and like the Eastern European, ancient Eastern European, whatever, what's now Armenia, right? Like yeah. how the Roman emperor taken them, those folks became more Roman and demanded to be treated like Romans, but then the Roman emperor was like, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, then when the Col- Roman emperor collapsed, the Roman empire collapsed, 
uh, those people essentially came out living Roman lives, yeah. like like Romans. Okay, great. Now let's look at Middle East. Um, the I think Assyrian Assyrian Empire, um, like or whatever the the first Islamic um, Middle Eastern Empire, right, had done the same for Turkey and Iran, which are not Islamic Arabs, but now they are. Yeah. How did that happen? Well, same cycle, right? The empire was there. Subject uh, these became subjects. Those subjects started to take on those practices and demanded to be treated the same way as the regular Arabs are. The empire was like, nah, we don't want to do that. Lots of war, lots of bloodshed. When the empire fell, you now have Turkish Arabs and um, Iranian Arabs, right? That, yeah. So you, this unification of humankind idea was that through empires, we actually did evolve like a collective identity. And, um, you know, it, it's been bloody, it's been patchy as well, but it worked. I think the, the final comparison is colonialism, which is so true, right? Like India is a great example where it comes to be liberal now. Uh, with like uh, you know chai is a drink we're all cricket lovers those are British things right yeah. we definitely got that from them <laughs> um, but yeah and, and so like even the idea of a democracy the idea of like voting and stuff like that definitely these like liberal traditions that were imported that when we decided to say okay self represent can you give this to us they were like no absolutely not like yeah. you shouldn't do this I know it I know I'm doing it but you shouldn't do it um, but when they actually left and the British Empire fell, like all the colonies adopted it, right? Nigeria did, um, even China, in Hong Kong at least. Well, not anymore, but... Um, <laughs> That's another story. Yeah, <laughs> a different episode, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, so the, the Empire's topic is interesting because I think that another thing, another thing that he does, which is nice, right? he debunks myths, right? Like yeah. we are taught to, that empires are unsustainable and bad systems of governance. Dude, newsflash, like 2,500 years of human history had empires as the most stable form of government. Yeah. It is only in the last, like, 100, 150 years that we, in 1789, when, like, like you know, peasants in France were like, oh, hey, you know what, we should do this, actually. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, only, like, it's a very new idea in the larger scale of human history to have the masses actually have any say. Uh, empires are actually the more um, culturally dominant way of like and it's so you know maybe that's how maybe maybe that's why when we think of group dynamics maybe like that's why in like male dynamics there's like this concept of alpha male because we are so tuned to thinking of like one person leading yeah uh, because of the past 1500 years of um, um, the way our like social systems and political systems are I know that's a bit of a stretch but like uh, I feel like it's not too much of a stretch. I would think. I, I feel like I feel like this is where *Sapiens* has changed me. Where I take any yeah. aspect of like the way we live life and like trace it back to something ancient, and that's has shaped our. That's the myth, yeah. right? That is still yeah. resonant now, with us today. How far do you think most people's idea of history goes? I think I think people erroneously assume that before agriculture, it is like prehistory. We were all cavemen. Yeah. And I think I think agricultural revolution generally is where people start to think of history in the sense of like, oh, we started writing things down in civilization. So I don't think it's accurate, right? Because for two reasons. One, prehistory then was like way longer, right? Than yeah. like this agriculture is like the stuff that we've done is in a very short time frame relative to this like evolutionary scale. And so like we can't discount because biologically we're very similar to that like prehistorical ape, right? Yeah, so we, this is yeah. And this is very. This is what like twelve thousand years. Yeah, yeah, twelve thousand years. Of but which then we've like written tens 4, of thousands of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eighty hundred, right? Yeah. Eighty. The, the scale is like insane. And the thing is, like, our brains aren't good at large numbers, right? Like, yeah. um, um, so yeah, it's hard for us to actually visualize uh, how much of time that is. That's a lot of freaking time, right? Something I was I I was thinking about in the field museum, evaluating all these you know ancient artifacts and stuff. Something I, I don't think people think about is, I think, I think people always had a sense of humor. Oh, sure. Like, we don't think of like these people living way back when as like being funny or. No, but, I'm sure they did. Yeah. But a lot of them, these cultures, uh, created masks to like tell stories and stuff. Interesting. Yeah, there's like, um, there's that cave painting of the like prehistoric, uh, prehistoric man. I don't want to use the word, but like um, the pre-agricultural revolution. Um, the, Homo sapiens, right? Where a bunch of people put their hands on a cave. Yeah. And like I read that as like I was here. You know, when you leave a sand print, like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the same thing, right? Yeah. Like the, the the joy of saying or like 
you know, if you see wet concrete, put I'm in your hand. I'm going to put this here and it'll be here forever. Exactly, right? <laughs> like, to, to leave a mark yeah. is such a uniquely human desire. Yeah, um, yeah it's... Uh, uh, I, I think you're right. I, I don't think that we've changed that much uh, biologically um, from way back then to now. You know, we are seeing, like, you know, people are, like, shorter attention spans because of phones. Yeah, like, you do see, like, change, of course. Yeah. But I think that your DNA thinks you're in the savannah and, like, you're on the hunt for a growl or, like, that's why you still have those reflexes and stuff like yeah. that. I mean, that like, it makes you... It's a humbling book, you know? I think it's that... It's very humbling. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm not that well versed on part four uh, because I think this is where it gets into the, his sequel right Homo Deus the scientific yeah. stuff where I think so he's got a chapter on capitalism which is really good uh, he's got I think the idea is that like in 1500 is when we started to use science for power and uh, like okay so military and science wasn't really so a like, thing like right? uh, 500 years ago like yeah. 50, so basically 500. like in the time of Columbus, things are... Exactly, yeah. exactly in the time yeah. of Columbus, yeah. Because Columbus needed an investor. That's actually what the capitalism chapter is about, is about uh, Columbus needing someone to help fund his expedition. And it'll talk about how, like, how those two... Th like, when when the age of the scientific man dawned, so too did um, our society evolve to support that. And, like, one of the outcomes was capitalism. And yeah. because it would... It was a... The, the way of thinking now was I don't know everything I would like to figure everything out and I can do that by like rigorous observation and calculation yeah um, and then like all of our societal structures changed as well and evolved or well evolved evolved I don't know changed to support that myth and capitalism was yeah. one of the things yeah it's, it's a cool chapter so that, yeah that I mean yeah. that gets you then to the industrial revolution and then that transform yeah. everything and the the military one was very interesting too it's like uh we actually never had a scientific approach to military up until like i think in between world war or up until world war one which is crazy if you think about it so like it's not like we weren't fighting wars right like the mongols well, we're fighting like, all the time well, all this much. Like, yeah. like when when the chinese discovered gunpowder they used it for fireworks yeah. it was purely by accident that 500 years later it became like the can canonical warfare was forced to think. Yeah. You know, the Chinese, like, Han Dynasty didn't have, like, some bureaucratic office that was like, okay, what is the military use for this particular product that we've discovered, right? Yeah. I think the, the story of gunpowder is that they were trying to discover the elixir of life, some alchemists. And then, like, they blew themselves up. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, we never actually... Uh, so using science for like a destructive purpose is also like a recent phenomenon from World War One, uh, where trench yeah. warfare was a thing, and then people were like, "Oh, how do we do this?" And that's why tanks became a thing. So, because they're like, "Oh, we can build these cool weapons." Yeah, like World War One. If you look into like World War One, that's like the first time in like killing on an industrial scale. Yeah. Just like horrifying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So. So we got those four, and now we're kind of in the scientific revolution. We'll save Homo Deus for another for future, episode. Yeah. Uh, that Homo Deus is a book. In the last three years of reading, that book has probably changed my behavior or changed my outlook one of the most. Yeah. Um, it's like, yeah, I love history and everything, but like, I have to prepare myself yeah, for, for what's the coming. future. Yeah. yeah. But to re let's recap some of the things from Sapiens. What, sure. what did you pull away most from it? Okay, so th the... I think, like, I, I think the thing that I pulled back the most was to take a more, like, humble view of humanity's place within history. Uh, and, and, and a more... Um, like, to think a little bit with more about any sensation that I feel and, like, is this... Like, how does this tie to larger human behaviors, right? Yeah. I, I think that, like, the whole idea of individualism and, like, everything that you do is unique in your own, that, like, my ego took a huge beating after reading this because not everything, a lot of what you do is determined by these, like, other factors that we just believe inherently. Yeah. So I think that, like, to catch myths in, like, just regular conversation that I, like, like, I, I, you know, keeping an almost counter of like, okay, how many times did I say something that actually relates to a physical world problem? 
and some days it's zero. Like re really, yeah. like you know, I talk about like my immigration issues. That's totally made up, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just some bureaucratic nonsense. I talk about work. That's also totally made up, right? Yeah. Like, um, like a pharmaceutical company does not need to know how to whatever. You know, it's yeah. useless, right? So how many, uh, it's only when you go on a vacation or something like that that you're like, wow, this is so beautiful, right? It's yeah. very rare. So I think like cherishing those moments a little bit more because it's nice to like be a little bit more connected to reality. I feel. Um, but at the same time, I don't like. I don't. I think that one of this, this book taught me also is like just because you learn, just because like the the curtain is pulled on you and you see the world for what it is, doesn't mean you have to be shocked by it. Doesn't mean you have to be disgusted by it. Doesn't make it good or bad. It just makes it as it is. Yeah. And I think that's where like he has uh, influenced me. Just him as a writer has influenced me. Okay. Where like he's so. Um, scientific in the way that he writes he's very scientific he's, it's so like this is it this is this is just a fact right you i i will tell you that you know this is neither right nor wrong but just this is this is my take this is my opinion this is how it yeah. is um i try to like try to be like that actually about the world too it's like hey like what is the truth and the observation see people don't like that yeah people yeah. do not like don't that. want to build a narrative yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it's it's I like history a lot. Um, I'm definitely a nerd for um, just this content, right? It's yeah. it's very informative, and I think that like my history in in anthrop my, my interest in anthropology has also like really increased as a result of this. Yeah. But the yeah the biggest take back is like just this reduction in ego, like where humans live in the spectrum of the history of the world. Yeah. Uh, what, what what about you? Like where where I would say like. I feel like I haven't read a, a book about human history as thorough as this, and I mean, because this is just like a brief summary, but but like brief, yeah, it's like, like 400 pages, right? <laughs> well, you could write a whole yeah. lot, right? Uh, uh, I yeah, like you, I just just devour this type of content. Yeah, yeah, because I'm very curious about like, like I'm you, I'm here right here in time but like and, and I don't think time is linear but when we're trying to conceptualize about it everybody it's like I'm just part of something yeah and I, I want to I want to know more about what I'm a part of and why I am the way I am yeah um, and I think it, it does a good job of just eliminating all these other opinions and biases and it's just like, like yeah this this is I definitely I think that like I seek out books that are more objective like this so yeah. Bill Bryson's a good um, you know he's like he's like if, if you've all had a sense of humor like it would be Bill Bryson okay because he's so like, that's something yeah, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> but okay so I, I bring that up that he comes across as cold yeah. Um, <laughs> well, because you've read Homo Deus too, and that uh, he's, no, oh, he's, he's freezing cold. Yeah, yeah there's, <laughs> there's not a warm, fuzzy feeling that you get no. after reading that one, right? No, yeah. no, no. Um, someone told me it's because uh, I don't know if this is true or not. Like Israelis don't really have a great sense of humor. <laughs> I don't know. My manager is Jewish. She's really funny, but she's Jewish. I don't know. She's not from Israel. So. But he's from Israel. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, I have seen like Israeli comedy TV shows. Okay. Um, so I mean, there, <laughs> there is funny? a sense. Yeah, they're kind of funny. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is just him as an individual, just like. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, he is. Um, yeah, I don't imagine like laughing a lot if I meet him. So, but I would love to. <laughs> yeah. So we'll we'll talk again about Homo Deus, and okay. that's that's going to be a really exciting. Yeah, uh, I'll I definitely have to read that one. Uh, yeah. I again, I've only heard excerpts from my dad when he read it. Okay. Um, but there are some. I mean, I well, the passage that uh, that really stuck me. If I can give the listeners a preview of what's going to come. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> was it's just called a tease. <laughs> a teaser. Trailer, right? Yeah. So it's uh, he'll he'll equate the algorithmic process of making a decision, like based off of data that is available, to your process of making a decision, um, just in general, like how your brain computes everything, 
is like literally exactly the way when we write these algorithms, it's like the same, right? I gather data about the world around me and it pushes my neurons to either fire an electrical impulse to do this or that. Yeah. It's either a one or a zero. Yeah. And every single decision thought that you make can just be diluted down to this one really fucking fast algorithm that's doing that. Yeah. And it's it's a are you a computer? Like, is, is, it's a, it's a, it really makes you ask that question. I, th I think we are. Well, yeah. uh, just to plug in another episode. Uh, in, yeah, they call it a plug. About, That's what they call it. This, this is a plug. Uh, <laughs> the last episode. Episode 105 on the podcast. Information processing and operating systems. So I now oh, kind sorry. of view myself as, as humans, we're information processors. And computers are just have much more ability to process so faster so quickly but I'm getting data and information of everything that I'm perceiving you know the bark on the tree right there the brick wall the plants the floating the, pollen that's been bothering yeah, me yeah 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 <laughs> all these all these things I'm processing them and um, it's informing my view of the world my perspective of the world and so like now, I've been on just like this rate of learning that's going so quickly and it's so intense that I burn out and like I burn out every like four to six weeks and then what happens is I, I then get this like epiphany or realization and I call that updating my operating system <laughs> and then it, it gives me energy for the next four to six weeks. Well, it's, that's great. Dude, it's I like, love this. It's this, this really amazing. weird thing. But you know, like with your computers and uh, your phones and stuff, you always have to be updating. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's new information. There's new technology. There's new uh, security things. Well, also restarting Updated. your machine is a great way to get, extend its life, yeah. right? Like if you daily turn your computer off and then reboot it every yeah. day, because it like clears the cache and like it does a lot of good things with the computer. Same thing is true for the human body, so right? We're, like rest we're very stuff is similar to, yeah. to computers. We. Okay, I'll give you one further. We are, what we create is in the image of ourselves. Yeah. I, all the things that we design are in some sense an extension of what we are. Um, I don't, I don't, I, just, here's yeah. a hot tick. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave you with that. <laughs> okay, interesting. All right, well, on that note, uh, definitely check out Sapiens. It's a dense read, but I... Uh, I think you'll blow through it because it's about us as humans and how collectively we created this world. This world. Enjoy. <laughs>